Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 76 to 80. So first I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 76, 77, 78, 79, and 80. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 76, it says an alkyl halide is formed with various halide R groups. Which of the following R groups would yield the molecule with the least likelihood of participating in an SN2 reaction? So we're talking about alkyl halides, and then we're saying that we can have various halides with the R group. Which one would least likely undergo SN2? So an alkyl halide can look like this, and then we have some X, which is our halide. That's our leaving group. And then we can have a nucleophile come in and displace that leaving group, which would be our halide. So that's what an alkyl halide looks like. It's a carbon chain with some halogen attached to it. And then in the answer options, we have different halogens. And the one that is going to most likely go undergo SN2 is going to be the one which has the weakest bond between carbon and the halide group and that would be iodide. Iodide has the worst bond between the two because iodide is in that group of the periodic table. It's the largest atom. It has the largest atomic radius therefore carbon and iodide their bond can't be that close together and then when you have a bond further apart that means it's a weaker bond. So the carbon iodide bond is easier to break than relative to the other halides. Therefore, the best leaving group is iodine. And then we're asked in this question, which one would least likely participate in SN2? So the opposite logic applies, the one which has the strongest bond to the carbon. That's the one that's least likely going to be broken with the addition of a nucleophile. So that carbon halide bond is gonna take like a lot of energy to break. It's unlikely to undergo SN2. The one with the strongest bond would be fluoride, smallest like atomic radius and largest electronegativity as well. So there's a strong bond between carbon and fluoride. Therefore, it doesn't readily break and SN2 doesn't happen as much. In question 77, it says, given the molecule on the left, what will happen to the pKa if an azido group replaces one of the hydrogens from the methyl group? The structure of the azido group is shown to the right of the original molecule. So look at the molecule on the left which is this carboxylic acid. And we want to know what happens to the pKa if this azido group is added. So one of the hydrogens are gone. This is now H2. And then we have these nitrogens attached like this. So nitrogen with the rest of it as well. So that's what it looks like. Compared to the original carboxylic acid, what would happen? Well, what happens with a carboxylic acid, we're talking about pKa in this question, meaning its tendency to act as an acid. If it's low pKa, then it's a stronger acid compared to something with a higher pKa. So when this carboxylic acid gets deprotonated, what happens is we get a negative charge over here, which this oxygen does not like to carry. So it distributes the negative charge through resonance. So now the oxygens exchange which one has a double bond at one time, and which one is carrying the negative charge. Therefore, that negative charge is spread. And because of resonance, that conjugate base is more stabilized. Now, when we add this group instead of one of the hydrogens, so compared to the original carboxylic acid, now we have an electron withdrawing group, which it's an electron withdrawing group because of the electronegativity of the nitrogen. So due to the inductive effect, we're going to get electron density going towards nitrogen. And so we have another place for this negative charge, that electron density to be distributed to. So therefore it's gonna to go towards the azido group and now the oxygens feel the effect of that charge even less so. Therefore they're fine being in that state. And so we have a more stable conjugate base. So what's going to happen when we add this azido group is that we get a more acidic carboxylic acid, meaning a lower pKa so lower pKa, and then the reason for this is because that negative charge is more distributed. So option A is saying, upon addition of the azido group, 
the molecule's pK will increase. That would be incorrect. B is saying it will, will decrease. Okay, that's fine. Compared to the original molecule without the azide group, because the azide group stabilizes the negatively charged conjugate base. Yes, that is correct. Option C is saying that once again, pK will increase because of that. We cross out option C. And option D is saying upon addition of the azide group, the molecule's pK will decrease. That's fine. But the explanation is because the azide group destabilizes the negatively charged conjugate base. If it was to destabilize that conjugate base, that means that that conjugate base is going to be more reactive. And it's not a species which is going to stay around for a while, meaning it's going to go back towards the acid form. And therefore, we don't have a stronger acid and a lower pK. So that logic is incorrect. It's because it stabilizes the conjugate base that the conjugate base stays around more. And then we have a more acidic carboxylic acid. So B is the correct answer here. In question 78, we're asked into which solvent would the following compound most easily dissolve? So we want to know the solvent that this compound dissolves in. And so that means that we have to look at the properties of this compound. So the compound is overall pretty hydrophobic because you see all these carbons and hydrogens, but the exception is this ketone group over here, which means it has some polarity. So we need some type of organic solvent which can dissolve this organic compound, but also a polar organic solvent. So option A is acetone, this would be correct. So acetone is an organic solvent, and it's a very polar solvent as well. And acetone is also a ketone. So that ketone is going to dissolve well. And relative to the other ones, this solvent is going to be the best. Water is not going to be good because of all the hydrophobic part of the molecule. That is not going to mix well with water. So that is incorrect. And then we can also remove option D, which is essentially, it's a hydrogen peroxide, which is essentially, you can treat it the same as water. And finally, hexane, we can remove because it is an organic solvent, sure. It would be good if we had a compound that just looked like this with the carbons and hydrogens, but the addition of that polar ketone group makes hexane not a good solvent because hexane is completely nonpolar. It's just six carbons. And so it would not, it would not like solvate well with that polar part of the molecule. Therefore, it would not dissolve well. So acetone would be a better choice. In question 79, we're asked, which of the following was accurate regarding SN1 reactions? So we're talking about SN1 reactions and we want to know what is accurate. So one of these is correct. The rest have some flaw in the answer option. Option A is saying they take, a, they take place in a single step. That's incorrect. So we can just do a quick example of an SN1 reaction. So what happens in an SN1 reaction? Here I have a tertiary carbon. First of all, the halide group leaves, and then we get this intermediate, which is called a carbocation. And then after that, our nucleophile is going to come in and then react with this carbocation. And we can say it essentially looks like that at the end. Here is the slow rate determining step. And then the second one, the addition of that nucleophile is the fast step. So option A implied that it takes place in a single step. No, just because there's a one there doesn't mean it's a one step reaction. The one means that it's it's a unimolecular reaction, meaning the rate determining step is only dependent on the concentration of the electrophile and not the nucleophile. Option B is saying no nucleophilic attack is required. Nope, as you can see in the second step, there is attack from the nucleophile onto that carbocation. Option C is saying halides very rarely serve as leaving groups. Nope, halides are the most common type of leaving groups. They're very good leaving groups. They are often used in SN1 reactions. And finally, option D is correct. It's saying the reaction passes through a planar intermediate molecule, which would be this right here, the carbocation, which is positively charged and it's a planar molecule. Therefore, when you get attacked by the nucleophile, you're, if you have stereochemistry, it could be both, both enantiomers are going to be formed because we can get attacked from either face. So D is correct regarding SN1 reactions. Question 80 is saying a strong base is added to a triglyceride. The reaction can be best characterized as what? So when we take a strong base added to a triglyceride, what is that type of reaction called? So for example, it could be, 
like this. So this is a triglyceride, and then these are all H2. And then if we react with a strong base, such as NaOH or KOH, what happens is we get those acyl groups separated, we get that glycerol also separated. And so this type of reaction, it's called a saponification. So just remember that saponification is when we take some triglyceride and then react it to get the free fatty acid. So it would look like this. So free fatty acid, and then we would also get that, that glycerol molecule. It would look like that. And so we don't get any type of water as a product. So it's not condensation. A condensation reaction, also known as a dehydration reaction, is when two molecules come together and then one of the by byproducts that they release is water. So that would be if we went like this other way, but we're going to the right. We're releasing those free fatty acids. So it's a saponification. Um, option A deals alder. No, that's a, another type of reaction in organic chemistry. That's when we take some, like a conjugated system and then react it with a double bond. So it's a lot of like pi bond interactions and then it ends up giving us a ring at the end. That's a different type of reaction. And it's definitely not an SN2 reaction. That's like one of the most basic reactions in organic chemistry. You should realize that a strong base reacting with triglyceride, that is not an SN2 reaction. It is attack at a, a carbonyl. And once again, it's saponification. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, if you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is in the description below. And in that course, we go through a lot more questions just like this video going through all the different answer options and explaining why each one is correct or incorrect so that you get the right logic for the MCAT. Other than that, make sure to subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. That's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.